Who holds the heavens in his hand? Who made the stars by the word of his power? Who put the spirit in man? And causes all the earth to cry out glory. He is righteous and worthy to be worshipped and adored. Lift your voices and give glory to the Lord. He is righteous. He is righteous and worthy to be worshipped and adored. Lift your voices and give. Lift your voices and give. Glory to the Lord. Worship Him, the God of our salvation. Glory to the Lord. Honor Him. He reigns, He rules the nations. He is righteous and worthy to be worshipped and adored. Lift your voices and give glory to the Lord. Worship Him, the God of our salvation. Glory to the Lord. Honor Him. He reigns, He rules the nations. He is righteous and worthy to be worshipped and adored. Lift your voices and give glory to the Lord. Glory to the Lord. Glory to the Lord. Come on, somebody. Give God some praise in the house. Amen. He's worthy. Yeah. Glory to the Lord. Amen. There were some questions in that song. The questions was who, who, um, who made the heavens with his hands? Who did it, Pastor Darius? Yeah. Who made, watch this, who made the stars by the word of his power? It didn't even say the power of his word. It said the word of his power. See, there's power in his word, but there's also word in his power. Lord have mercy. Yes, indeed. Come on, let's keep going. Cue that next song up back there. <coughs> Amen. <laughs> Love you, and we're here to give you praise. Lord, we 
wish of you for the rest of our day. Heavenly Father, God of righteousness, we are hungry for your holiness. Lord of mercy and amazing grace, we bow down and seek your face. There's no other. Lord, we do seek your face. We desire, Lord, to see you in all of your splendor and all of your majesty and all of your beauty. Lord, we take this time now to offer up this sacrifice of worship and praise to you. We pray, Lord, that it is ascending into your nostrils as a sweet-smelling savor. We love you this morning, Lord, and we worship you in spirit and in truth. And we're going to go out with this just before our prayer time today. Let's worship the Lord together.
to be 
but hurt won't let me see so now i must be silent your voice is in the winds the hands that made the heavens will heal the storm within i had so many questions i don't know where to begin since you were there at the beginning you are Again, we bow before you, Lord, we ask that you would give us understanding of this portion of scripture and wisdom to be able to apply it to our lives. And we'll thank you in Jesus name. Amen. I've entitled the, the message today. Let your labor of love be with hope in your heart. And, you know, we've been talking quite a bit as we've been going through this book of Thessalonians uh, that there's a call to service, a call for us to exercise uh, our service to God in the context of faith, hope and love. And, and so as we go about uh, sacrificing our time and inconveniencing ourselves for the sake of the gospel, uh, we need to do it with hope in our heart. We need to do it understanding that even though the times get hard, even though the going gets tough, that there is still hope that we can look forward to. And all the way back in the beginning of this book, if you remember in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, uh, Paul emphasizes his big three that he, he mentions often in his epistles, faith, hope, and love. And those three are important concepts that we need to grab a hold of and, uh, and exercise in our lives. He underscores the importance of these three characteristics, and uh, most notably, to the church in Corinth in chapter 13, that love chapter, at the end of that love chapter, he says that the, the big three are faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. And as we wind toward the end of this letter, we find him focusing on the need for us to have hope. For us to have hope in God's plan. And this passage reminds us that as we labor for God, as we serve God, as we inconvenience ourselves for the gospel, that we don't do it out of despair. We don't do it blindly, but we do it with hope in our heart. The first thing that I want you to see is that hope comes with understanding. Hope comes with understanding. Uh, in order to have the kind of hope that doesn't waver, the kind of hope that you can lean on, you have to base your hope on clear understanding. That there needs to be an appreciation for the facts. It has to be based on some facts from the word of God. And you know, Christians today are weary of the facts. Christians today are weary of doctrine. Christians today don't want to spend time learning the information that would build up their hope. Christians today in many churches, not, again, I'm not talking about Monco. I know you all. But unfortunately, even here at Monco, some of us get weary of the facts. 
We get weary of doctrine. We get weary of teaching. And we would rather have somebody just tickle our ears. We would rather have somebody just get us excited. We would rather just cut up the rug rather than learn something. Am I right about it? No. Good. <laughs> uh, fortunately, uh, we, we are, should be at the place where we understand that hope comes with understanding. And so Paul begins verse 13 by stating there, he says, but I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. That's New King James. The idea there is those who have died, those who are already passed on, lest you sorrow as as those who have no hope. In other words, he's speaking on behalf of, of uh, Silas and Timothy, and many of the older manuscripts and some of the newer translations have the word we there rather than I. And so he's speaking on behalf of all of uh, his team, and he says that he doesn't want them to be ignorant. He wants them to, to learn. He wants them to understand what God's program is. And let me tell you something. Any pastor worth his salt is going to want his people not to be ignorant. He's going to want his people to understand what the word of God is teaching. And you may have to spoon feed some, you know, as Hebrew says, some can only handle a little bit of milk. But, but even while you're spoon feeding and, and, and dropping drops in their mouth, uh, the idea is and the goal is to give them as much as they can digest so that their understanding will be elevated. And with that understanding comes hope in what God is going to do. And so Paul, with that little bit of an introduction in verse 13, he begins a lesson on eschatology. That's just a big word that, that talks about prophecy. It talks about what God's plan is for the future. That, that Paul now is going to try and share with them what God is going to do in the future. And the reason that he does that is because there were teachers that were going around the various churches behind Paul. And they were teaching bad doctrine. One of the things that they were teaching was that you had to become a Jew in order to benefit from Christ. So you had to be a proselyte to Judaism in order to become a Christian. And Paul attacks that, especially in the book of Galatians. But another bad doctrine that, that was being taught was that some of them were saying that the kingdom of God is going to come when Christ returns. But those relatives of yours and mine that have already died, those relatives that have already passed on, they missed the boat. That if you're not alive when Christ comes back, then you're out. You just missed it. Because when he comes, he's dealing with the people who are still alive. And so if you, like me and most of us, we have, you know, some of our loved ones that have gone on to be with the Lord. You're like in despair. Well, no, how could they miss out on God's plan and God's program? It was a source of total despair for many of these Christians. And so Paul desires to straighten them out and to give them some clarity about what God's plan was for the future. He seeks to correct this bad teaching. Here's what he says. When we die, our bodies return to the ground waiting for the resurrection while our spirits go to be present with the Lord. Now, since they got me up here with a little bit of time, uh, let me give you a couple of verses that you can make a note of and maybe check out later. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 7 underscores that concept. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8 underscores that concept that, that for the believer to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so, so what Paul is saying, first of all, is that, is that when we talk about sleep, we're not talking about soul sleep. 
We're not talking about your soul going to sleep. We're talking about your body going to rest in the grave, your body going back to dust, waiting for that day when the trumpet is going to sound and the resurrection of Christ is going to reunite uh, your soul and your body. Are you with me? And so our bodies go to sleep in the grave. They deteriorate even, but when that time comes, he's going to pull it all together. You know, I ask uh, sometimes a question comes up. Well, what about the sailors that they threw over the overboard in the ship and the fish come and they, you know, take the the guy in 20 different directions? Uh, What's going to happen to them? Well, let me tell you something. We have a sovereign God. Amen. And I don't know what his methodology is going to be, but if he can pull a body together out of the dust of the ground, he can pull a body together out of the fish of the sea. It's no big deal for him. What he says is that there is going to be a resurrection. And that resurrection is going to reunite a body which sleeps and a soul which is present with the Lord. And those who have gone on before us, they are going to be resurrected and they're not going to miss out on God's program. Somebody say hallelujah. It's no big deal for God when, when, you know, whether it's my parents that I had to, to, to see them go into the ground or some of us have had loved ones that were recently put down into the ground. They're not, if they're in Christ, they're not missing out on a thing. That God has a plan for them just like he has a plan for us. Somebody needs to say Amen. And so Paul desires to instill some hope into these believers with good understanding and good doctrine. You see, bad teaching has consequences. When you sit under bad teaching and absorb that, it has consequences. Understand, that's why understanding doctrine is important. And in the case of the bad teaching, left, uh, they, they, it left many of those believers in total despair about their loved ones that had died already. But how many of you know that today we have bad teaching? And just go up and down the dial. There's bad teaching all around us. And we need to be aware of uh, some of this teaching that goes around because it has consequences. There are those who teach that Christians are healed and so they never get sick. And and let me tell you something, it has consequences. There there are people who say, don't even go to the doctor because the devil's a liar. It has consequences. It can can be life and death consequences. Uh, There are Christians who who teach that speaking in tongues is the main manifestation of the Holy Spirit. And if you don't speak in tongues, then you're outside of Christ. It has consequences. And when you sit under and absorb bad teaching, it affects so many areas of your life. And so we need to, we need to understand that, that we need to have good teaching. And, and, and you know what? Let me say this. And we've we'll used this example before. You don't have to go and study every bad teaching that's out there. You don't have to go and study every, you know, bad doctrine. And you don't need to, to study uh, all the various ways that, that the gospel is twisted. But it's like the FBI, you know, when they're going to learn to teach their agents to recognize a phony dollar bill, they don't bring in all the various versions of phony dollar bills. They study the real dollar bill so closely that as soon as somebody tries to pass a fortune, a forfeiture of uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Forgery. Yeah, a forgered dollar bill. It will, uh, it'll catch their eye and catch their attention. And so uh, we, need to, we need to spend our time in the word of God. We need to absorb good teaching. And let's not get tired of learning doctrine. I mean, I'm all for application. 
I am 100% for application. I think application is critical to learn how that doctrine applies to my life. I think that's absolutely critical. But you can't to get to application until you understand the doctrine. And so Paul starts out by trying to correct some of this bad teaching. And, uh, and so real hope that you can bank on comes with understanding God's plan. But there's something else I want you to see right there in verse 14. And that is that hope comes with faith. Hope comes with faith in the resurrection. In verse 13, Paul addresses the false teaching that was going around concerning those who had already died. And there's no need to sorrow as those who have no hope for their dead loved ones because we have hope. We have hope that is rooted in God's plan for all of his children. There are none of his children that are going to miss out on God's plan. And, and so Jesus died and rose again and 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that he is the first fruits of our resurrection. Somebody turn to that real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let me see if I can get there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 starting at verse 20. He says, but now Christ is risen from the dead. And has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Those who have already died. You know what first fruits are, right? First fruits are when you're going to harvest. It's that first fruit that pops up. That first apple that shows up on the branch. That first grape that shows up on the, on the vine. That first bit of harvest. Uh, and what that the first fruit indicates is that first of all, you got the right kind of tree. But also, it, it gives you hope that the rest of the fruit is going to follow. It gives you hope that the harvest is going to come. And so Christ, his resurrection is the first fruits of our resurrection. And, and so even those who have already died, those who have already passed on, Christ and his resurrection, faith in that resurrection gives us hope that they too are going to see the resurrection. Uh, verse 21 says, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. And so we have hope uh, based on faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, our persistent, dedicated labor of love and service in this life is based on the hope that we have because of the power of God demonstrated by Jesus' resurrection. And it's the promise of our resurrection. It's the promise that we have, that hope that we have. Even if we put down these bodies to sleep before he comes back. You know, we're not losing anything. Thank God that hope comes from faith in the fact of the resurrection. Amen? Amen? If you're lacking faith, faith comes by hearing. And as we hear the word of God and act on the word of God, that, we, that builds that hope in us. Amen? Look at verse 15 to 17. In verses 15 to 17, I want you to see that hope is available for all of God's people. For all of God's people. Paul emphasizes that he's giving hope not out of wishful thinking, but hope based on the word of God. You know, there are a whole lot of people who look at our hope in Christ as simply wishful thinking. As simply, you know, uh, we're just, it's like Christianity is just a crutch that we're leaning on. Like Christianity and our faith in Jesus Christ is nothing substantial to, to, to bank it on. But I'm here to tell you that, I don't know about yours, but my faith is based on a reasonable, intelligent faith based on the word of God. It's based on the fact that I believe that this book is the revelation of God's word to man. It's not based on wishful thinking. It's not, it's not just a crutch that I lean on. It's not just something to help me feel good in bad times. It is the truth of God revealed through his word. 
And I want to tell you, there is enough, if I have any skeptics in the room, there is enough evidence to substantiate the word of God as the truth of God and his word that it is more than reasonable to lay down your life and bank on this being the word of God. Is there a witness in the house? And so uh, we need to make sure that we have that kind of faith based on the word of God. Uh, in verses 15 to 17, he says, for we say to you by the word of God that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will raise first. And so he's, he's giving hope, not out of wishful thinking, but based on the word of God. That means that he's either a liar or what he's saying is reliable. It's a rock that we can trust in. It's a light that we can follow. It's a revelation of truth that is consistent with what we see in the world around us. And this verse makes it clear that there is no advantage to being alive when Christ returns. We who are alive will by no means be at the head of the line when Christ comes for his church. As a matter of fact, I, I say this, we who are alive are the ones at a disadvantage because those of our loved ones that are in Christ, they have escaped all the, the pain and suffering and issues of this world. And beyond that, they're first in line at the resurrection. We got to wait for them at the back of the line. We're dealing with this life now. And then plus we got to get at the back of the line at the resurrection. They have all the advantages. And so I just want to say a word of encouragement for those of us that have loved ones that have preceded us. That as long as they are in Christ, uh, they have they have all that they need and God has not let them escape out of his plan. The, the important teaching here is that none of God's children are going to miss out on God's plan. And uh, Hebrews 11 and verse 40, that's a, another good one. Let's flip over to that real quick. Hebrews 11 and verse 40. He says there, God having provided something better for us that they should not be made perfect apart from us. And so all of God's children, the ones who have preceded us in death, as well as, as those of us who are still alive when Christ comes, and I'm expecting the, that he'll come before my day, but I remember my, you know, my father and all those guys. I remember every watch night service as a young guy, and you know, every generation has expected Christ to come back at that time, and we don't really know when he's going to come back. He could come today. He could come tomorrow. He might not come for another thousand years. I don't really know. All I do know is that none of God's children are going to miss out on his plan. Whether he's alive, uh, whether we're alive or whether we die, we're going to be a part of that institution that he calls the church. And so we all look forward to being caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Uh, you know, when you, when you look at, at these verses here, uh, let me read verses 16 and 17. It says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Um, now, can I teach for a little bit? The, everybody's heard about the rapture. That word rapture, we get from this verse where it says caught up 
together in there. And now there are some believers, godly men and women who see that, well, that doesn't necessarily refer to the rapture. That could just refer to a gathering of God's people at the second coming. And I'm not going to stake my life on one or the other. My view is that I believe that that's referring to the rapture. I think the language there, especially when it says caught up in the clouds, that, that, that this meeting the Lord is going to be in the air doesn't sound like the second coming. But one thing that we all agree on, whether you're Presbyterian, you know, Anabaptists or whatever group you want to identify with and whatever chart you make, you know, I always say that there are a bunch of Christians and their charts look different when it comes to laying out the future. But one thing that we can all agree on, and that is that the Lord is coming again. He's going to gather all of his people together. And from that moment on, we're going to be with him forever. Whether or not, you know, as I, I, I would believe, and I think the, the scriptures indicate, especially when you study Revelation, that when we get caught up in this rapture, that we'll be in glory for that seven-year period uh, while there's tribulation down here on this earth, and then there'll be a dissension of Christ with his church uh, back on this earth for the second coming. Um, maybe somebody here has their chart looks different. I always say that, you know, when we get the glory, we're going to find all of our charts were wrong. You know, that, that, so I'm not going to stake my life on my, on my, you know, dispensational chart. What I am going to stake my life on, however, is the imminent return of the Lord to gather his people. And to be honest with you, after that, I don't care what the chart looks like. Because I'm going to be with the Lord in glory. Anybody with me on that? <laughs> and so uh, I, I, I appreciate uh, what, what Paul is trying to say here. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, it says that, that with the, the trumpet, uh, the trumpet is going to sound. Well, that's not, well, first of all, you know, even the trumpets that they had in those days is not like our Philadelphia Orchestra trumpets. Um, that's, not, that's not the same instrument at all. And, and he's, since in 1 Corinthians 15, he talks about in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye. So we're not talking about a long song. <laughs> This is not a concert, right? We're not talking about a long song. This is in the blink of an eye. And so the idea of the trumpet sounding, I believe, is more of an announcement. It's more of a, a moment in time when he makes that call out to gather all of his people. And so don't wait around listening for the song. You might miss the tune, but, but the, the reality is that it is at that moment in time when he calls us up and it's going to happen quickly in the, in the twinkling of an eye. And so the important teaching here is that none of God's children are going to miss out on God's plan. He has a plan for all of his children. And as we sacrifice and persist in our labor of love for God, as we do our ministry, as we serve God in our various capacities, we do so with hope in our hearts that will never be left behind, that will not be forgotten by God, that, but we're going to be caught up to be together with him for eternity. Let me just close with verse 18. Verse 18, he says, Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Faith, hope, and love bring comfort to the church. There is nothing more comforting than to understand with confidence how the story ends. You know, I've used the illustration before of when you watch a football game and you've already heard the score and how it ends. You know, you can, you, you can be upset when you see the guy fumble the ball. You can be upset when, the, when you see the quarterback throw an interception. But not like those who have no hope. Because you know how the story ends. 
we are being told how the story ends. And it ends with God bringing all of his people together and we're going to be together with him forever. And so the, we can comfort each other because guess what? You have issues in your life and I have issues in my life. Amen? Amen. Don't get quiet now. We all have issues in our lives. We all have problems that we have to overcome. We all have stress. We all have, have, have things in our lives that, that we need to, to have victory over. And when we think about all the ups and downs, the disappointments and challenges that come with raising children, uh, sometimes there's jubilation and at other times there's tears. But when there is faith in their future and hope in the outcome, the love that we have for them provides us with hope. And, uh, and so in the same way, uh, faith, hope, and love bring comfort to the church. You can endure the challenges of life day by day as we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and focused on the word of God. And so I just want to encourage you today. I want to, I want to just close with a, by reading some familiar verses out of 1 Corinthians 15. Because again, those are some powerful words and familiar portion of scripture, just starting at verse 50 uh, through 58. Now this I say, brethren, starting at verse 50, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. In other words, you got to die. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruption, this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, verse 58, in light of that hope, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Do your labor of love in the context of hope. Amen. I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And just take a moment and ask God to speak to you. You know, we've said before that that love of God is what regulates us it, it pushes us it prompts us to do and to be what God has called us to be and if you're struggling with that with faith hope or love ask God to help you just now in the quietness of your own heart I'm not talking about joining anything I'm just talking about your relationship with God Ask him to help you. And as you have that little talk with Jesus, I just want to pray with you and up raised hand. Say, Pastor Tony, just pray for me. Amen. I see those hands. Just put a hand up, put it back down. Yes, I see those hands. Just put it up, put it back down. Say, pray for me. Amen. Last call. Any others? Just slip a hand up. Yes. Amen. I see that hand. 
Amen. And Monco, I'm going to ask us to stand in our feet for that closing word of prayer. And I'm going to invite those of you that raise your hands, and maybe if you, even if you didn't raise your hand, but you desire prayer, just to slip out of your seat and make your way down front. Let's pray together, whatever that need is in your life. Amen. Make your way down. We'll wait on you. You come. Amen. Amen. Amanco, join me as we pray for these that have come, others that raise their hands let's pray that God will do his thing in your life amen and Heavenly Father again we confess that we fall short Lord we have not always been who you've called us to be our faith has been weak our love has waned our hope sometimes has turned into despair and dismay but Lord, we thank you that, that you don't let us go, that you have a plan for us, for all of your children. Lord, we pray for each one of these, and you know exactly what they stand in need of. Lord, if there's one here that stands in need of salvation, we pray that you'd save them today. Cause that no one would leave this place without the full assurance of their sins being forgiven. Lord, we pray for other needs that may be represented here. Lord, we ask that, that all of us would allow the Spirit of God to, to rule and reign in our hearts. That that trilogy of faith, hope, and love would abound more and more in our lives. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.